Hey everybody, welcome back to another book study from Northeast Christian Apologetics. My name's Simon Williams, and today we're going to be talking about On Guard by Dr. William Lane Craig. We're going to be going through chapter six, uh, which is a, entitled, Can We Be Good Without God? And um, so just as a reminder to everyone that um, this book can be purchased on Amazon.com. Um, and you can also get it at christianbooks.com. So I uh, really encourage you guys uh, to get it so that to, you can have it as a reference for yourself or be able to read it on your own and study it in depth on your own. Um, but uh, if you don't have the ability to, to get it, then I definitely encourage you to watch these videos. Um, by the way, I have been uh, uploading and downloading these videos uh, to uh, YouTube. So... You don't have to be limited to read or seeing them here on Facebook. You can uh, check out the YouTube. And uh, but let's take a look at the argument that we're going to be talking about tonight. So the moral argument for the existence of God is as follows: um, If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. Um, just this is a week two of uh, trying out this uh, new mic. So let me know if you guys are having any audio issues or if you're hearing buzzing or anything like that. Hopefully uh, this is uh, better than what it has been. Um, just remember that this uh, mic is also really sensitive. So if you hear anything in the background, please, uh, you can let me know about it. and I can see what I can do, but uh, um there's not too much I can really do about it, you know. So, but um, as far as the moral argument goes, uh, it, to be honest with you, I'm not a huge fan of the moral argument uh, just because I don't think that it's uh, uh, very useful when uh, talking to non-believers and things like that. Um, I really think that uh, moral features of the world are better understood uh, the closer your relationship is with God. So uh, this one I don't really see uh, being very effective whenever I'm talking to people online or talking to people in person, things of that nature. So, but it is really effective for uh, deepening your understanding of God, deepening your understanding of the moral landscape, those kinds of things. And, um, Although uh, I personally don't run this particular moral argument, I run a different one, but it's still a really great introduction. And um, I think a lot of these arguments are very useful in that they uh, act as a great springboard for starting a, an investigation into different aspects of God and of reality. So, and just as I've said previously in other uh, live streams, uh, just remember... On Guard is an introduction, so we're not going to be able to go into everything here. And I'm probably going to be making other videos to kind of supplement these uh, these chapters, just like middle videos or something like that, uh, to, just to go into deeper detail and maybe offer some counterpoints, um, also some uh, deeper insights into other arguments for the existence of God that are similar to this. There's a lot of different moral arguments uh, for the existence of God. Um, that's one thing about uh, being a Christian theist is that we're kind of spoiled for uh, arguments. Uh, it, it, we have a worldview that's very easy to argue for. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, and, and you'll notice uh, from this argument that it's actually very simple. It's easy to remember, but just like the other arguments, it becomes more tricky when you uh, start actually having conversations about it with people. Um, Thanks for coming with me tonight on this journey. Uh, don't hesitate to leave any comments, and I will uh, address them as often as I can. Um, I think that I'm only able to see comments from my Northeast Christian Apologetics Facebook page. So um, bear that in mind if you want to interact. So without further delay, let's go ahead and uh, bring up the, the reading screen. Uh, I'm still using the format that uh, I used last week in order to uh, read the book. And uh, I got pos positive feedback on it from uh, multiple people, so I think that we're going to stick with it. 
But as you can see, Dr. Craig prefaces this uh, chapter with uh, uh, Mark 10, 18, and this is Jesus talking. Uh, no one is good but God alone. So can we be good without God? At first, the answer to this question might seem so obvious that even, it, even to ask it is apt to make people angry. For while Christians find in God a source of moral strength that helps us to lead better lives than those we, that we would have led without him, still it would be arrogant and ignorant to claim that uh, unbelievers don't often lead good moral lives. In fact, sometimes lives that put ours to shame. But wait! While it would be arrogant and ignorant to claim that people cannot be good without belief in God, that wasn't the question. The question was, can we be good without God? When we ask that question, we're posing a question about the nature of moral values. Are the values we hold dear and guide our lives uh, by just uh, social conventions? Like driving on the right side, or the right hand versus the left hand side of the road? Or are they merely expressions of personal preference, like having a taste for certain foods? Or are they somehow valid and binding, independent of our opinion? And if they are objective in this way, what is their foundation? So what is the basis of our moral values? Are they based on uh, social convention, personal preference, evolution, God? These are the kind of uh, options that we're going to be exploring tonight. So um, the moral argument for the existence of God. Now, many philosophers have uh, thought that morality provides a good arguments for God's existence. One of the finest was uh, William Sorley, who was a professor of moral philosophy at Cambridge University. In his Moral Values and the Idea of God, 1918, Sorley argues that the best hope for a rational, unified view of reality is to postulate God as the ground of both the natural and the moral orders. Sorley maintains that there is an objective moral order which is as real and independent of us as is the natural order of things. He recognizes that in one sense we can't prove that objective moral values exist. But he points out that in this same sense, we can't prove that the natural world of physical objects exists either. You could be a, you could be a body lying in the matrix experiencing a virtual reality. The moral order and the natural order are thus on a similar footing. Just as we assume the reality of the world of objects on the basis of our sense experience, so we assume the reality of the moral order on the basis of our moral experience. So, already, so we're already up to the first question of uh, the chapter, which is how, uh, how do you respond to the idea that the objective moral order is just as real as the objective physical world? Why? Uh, so uh, just as a reminder, uh, I'm going to provide you with my f uh, personal perspective on this. And uh, while I'm uh, pro providing this, uh, feel free to leave the comments in the chat and I'll address them as they come up. But to me, I, um, like I said in the uh, earlier on, um, I do believe that there is a, an objective moral landscape, but it's extremely difficult uh, for humans to perceive it. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the fall. Um, when it comes to, to uh, morality, um, the, thaw, the fall, from my perspective, is very integral in this because uh, what tree did we did Adam and Eve eat the fruit from it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and uh, and from my perspective it it didn't make our perspective or perception of the moral landscape clearer it actually muddied it because I think that this tree of moral knowledge was uh, to talk about moral knowledge in the sense that we have the ability to create morality where we uh, can believe that we know what good and evil is and define it ourselves. And you'll see that a lot, a lot, as you have conversations with people online or in person, that uh, people think that um, even if they don't say it outright, you, you get a sense that they believe that they're able to define morality in, in the way that they want it to be. Um, and they often craft, if they're theists, they often craft gods that... Uh, endorse their own view of morality instead of, uh, you know, allowing, for example, in Christianity, God speaks through the Bible. And oftentimes uh, God's uh, moral dictates 
are confusing or counterintuitive or different than what we would have uh, thought acceptable. And, but uh, a lot of people will craft gods that uh, do never that never disagree with them. But I think that this uh, this objective feature of morality is uh, really important to kind of grasp um, that it really is just as real as uh, the objective physical world around us. And we can understand those features through experience, but not but our perception of the moral landscape is a lot weaker than our perception of the physical world. Like um, we in order to really understand the scope of the moral landscape, we really need somebody to teach us and to describe it to us. And that's what God does in the Bible. But, uh, but yeah, I think that this is a really important concept to understand, that we are able to have uh, experiences of uh, morality. And we get those experiences through, like, moral anguish, a righteous fury, uh, love, that kind of stuff. All right, so in uh, Sorley's view, uh, both uh, the natural order and the moral order are part of reality. The question then is, what worldview can combine these two orders into the most coherent explanatory form? Sorley argues that the best explanation is God. There must be an infinite eternal mind who is the architect of nature and whose moral purpose uh, and whose moral purpose man and the universe are gradually fulfilling. Uh, I myself stumbled into the moral argument while speaking on university campuses on the absurdity of life without God. I argued that if there is no God, then there is no foundation for objective moral values. Every, everything becomes relative. To my surprise, the response of the students was to insist that objective moral values do exist. Certain things really are right or wrong. Now, and now what the students said didn't in any way refute my claim that without God there would be no objective values. Instead, they had unwittingly supplied the missing premise in a moral argument for God's existence. For now, we can argue, if God does not exist, moral objective moral values and duties do not exist. Number two, objective moral values and duties do exist. Number three, therefore, God exists. This simple little argument is easy to memorize and is logically ironclad. I had argued for the truth of the first premise and the students had insisted on the second. Together, the two premises imply the existence of God. What makes this argument so powerful is that people generally believe both premises. In a plural, pluralistic age, students are scarce to, scared to death of imposing their values on someone else. So premise one seems correct to them because it's implicit uh, because of its implicit relativism. At the same time, certain values have uh, been deeply instilled into them, such as tolerance, open-mindedness, and love. They uh, think it's objectively wrong to impose your values on someone else. So they're deeply committed to premise two as well. So we're, up to, so we're already up to the second premise, I mean the second question of the chapter. Have you ever had a conversation with someone who said there are no objective moral values that apply to everyone? If so, how did that person deal with values like tolerance and love? So I have um, uh, interacted with people that uh, say that there are no objective moral values that apply to everyone. Um, they do think that uh, morality is relative. Uh, they say that uh, uh, the moral landscape is uh, limited to conscious creatures and they think that the only conscious creatures there are are physical creatures uh, such as animals and humans and things of that nature um, but uh, really morality is limited to higher order conscious creatures like humans in particular uh, so but what that says and they and they think that morality is based off of uh, there's a lot of ways to go about doing this but um, there are there's some atheists out there that believe in some sort of like natural law um, morality in which uh, it's a, a platonic or scholastic notion of morality that uh, is uh, just entailed by the features of the world. Um, but also uh, there's a lot of people that or non-Christians in, in particular that believe in like uh, morality is tied to human flourishing or it's tied to human culture. And uh, these uh, cultural ideas uh, are, in my 
from my perspective, incredibly dangerous. Uh, I recently had a conversation on, or I witnessed a conversation and was included in it regarding um, the atrocities that are happening um, in Israel, like with the war going on. But before the war happened, uh, the uh, Hamas going in and kidnapping and raping and killing people. And um, the non-believer said that uh, um, there is no sense in which the jihadis or the uh, the, the Hamas soldiers had, a, a, there is no sense in which they had a moral obligation not to rape and kidnap. And uh, it's like, man, how can you say things like that? It strikes me as odd that anybody would be willing to say those kinds of things because it's so plainly obviously wrong and uh, as a matter of fact he said that uh, culturally speaking they actually had a moral obligation to do it um, because of the dictates of their culture from their perspective they actually did have moral obligation to do it uh, not objective moral obligation but cultural moral obligation and it's like oh oh man i uh, I cannot get on board with that. But um, as far as how those people deal with tolerance and love, they, they don't think that love is a genuine feature of reality. It's just a, you know, a psychological f- manifestation of your brain, the, the, the electrochemical reactions in your brain. <laughs> so it's like, why even talk about this stuff? And it's like, man, you, there a lot of these people's views on reality is so robotic. Um, it's hard for me to distinguish. I'm like, sometimes I want to ask, do you really have a genuine human experience? It's so weird. But yeah, that's a, that's been my um, uh, experience uh, having conversations with people on this. Uh, the, and, and that's why I get frustrated about the, the moral argument is because uh, and even when you listen to Dr. Craig uh, present the moral argument in the defenders class, this is a controversial topic. You know, um, a lot of people have a tough time. They struggle with the with notions of morality, Um, even uh, even even Christians, you know. So and that's probably why there's so many internal debates on things of this nature. But, yeah, um, without. uh, Oh, excuse me for a second. Okay, so uh, without any uh, more to go on that. Uh, let's move on. So, uh, Dr. Craig continues, this can lead some a very, uh, this can lead to some very strange conversations. I remember talking to one student who would jump back and forth between, uh, between the premises. Uh, when we did talk about the first premise, he'd, uh, he'd agree with it and deny the second premise. But when we'd move on to the second premise, he'd agree with it and deny the first. And so back and forth we went. And when uh, with him unable to make up his mind, it would have been funny had it not been so heart wrenching to see someone floundering in this way in an attempt to to avoid God. Uh, let's examine more closely each of the arguments, two premises, in order to see what defense you can offer on their behalf and what objections the non-believers might raise against them. Premise one. But before I move on. Uh, Oh, <laughs> Sam, uh, Sam says, uh, I want to comment, but I have no comment. I am in disbelief. Um, yeah, it is, uh, it's hard to stomach, you know, like, uh, there's a lot of people out there who, um, um, who are very logical and they, uh, have, uh, m- what's called metaphysical commitments and, uh, they bravely, um, Hold on to these, uh, uh, understand the metaphysical commitments, understand the metaphysical entailments, and then just embrace them. Uh, Your own human experience is uh, completely irrelevant, (laughs) you know? And it's like, well, what justification do you have for these metaphysical assumptions, these metaphysical commitments? And a lot of it, it, you know, a lot of them are naturalists. So on naturalism, there's only the physical world. And so there isn't any platonic world of the forms or anything in which they're genuinely tie objective moral values and duties to. So it's a, it's a, it's hard to watch when you see it online. That's for sure. So, uh, premise one, um, 
If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. Two important distinctions. The first premise that if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist involves some important distinctions that must be grasped before we can look at reasons for thinking that premise that uh, that premise is the premise is true. Excuse me. Values and duties. All right. Pay close attention to this because this is really important. Um, first, notice that I distinguish values and duties. Values have to do with whether something is good or bad. Duties have to do with whether something is right or wrong. Now, you might think at first that this is a distinction without a difference. Good and right mean the same thing, and the same goes for bad and wrong. But if you think about it, you can see that this isn't the case. Uh, values and duties. Moral values refer refers to the worth of a person or action, whether it is good or bad. Moral duty refers to our obligation to act in a certain way, whether the action is right or wrong. So duty has to do with moral obligation, what you ought or ought not to do. But obviously you're not morally obligated to do something just because it would be good for you to do it. For example, it would be good for you to become a doctor, but you're not morally obligated to become a doctor. After all, it would, be, it would also be good for you to become a homemaker or a farmer or a diplomat, but you can't do them all. Furthermore, sometimes all you have is bad choices. Think of Sophie's choice. But it's not wrong for you to choose one since you must choose. All right, so we're up to the third uh, uh, talk about it section of the book. So uh, make a list of some values, some things you believe are good or bad. Then make a list of duties, some things you believe are right or wrong. Compare your list to, to someone else's uh, to be sure uh, you're clear about the distinctions. So... Um, we're not going to be able to do this, uh, as intended by the book, but a short list of values, I think, uh, do ask the question, Sophie's choice. So Sophie's choice is a, a um, a scenario in it's, this is a uh, world war two thing dealing with the Holocaust. And Sophie, uh, is being taken to a concentration camp and she has two children and the soldiers there ask her, tell her that she must choose which child to bring to take to to for the soldiers to take to concentration camp and uh, for the other one for the soldiers to kill. So Sophie has to make a choice on which child to kill and which child to take uh, for the soldiers to take the concentration camp. And so neither choice is good. <laughs> They're both evil choices, but it's not. It's not wrong for Sophie to make the choice because she must choose. Um, and so what in, in the story, so, uh, Sophie ends up um, choosing uh, her son to go to a concentration camp and her daughter to be killed. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a rough one. But, uh, you know, those kind of things happen in, in the real world, you know. Um, and uh, it, it is heart-wrenching uh, to consider those things. But um, but uh, my list of values is basically just uh, um, the uh, the fruits of the spirit. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self control. Um, those are examples of values, and an example of uh, like bad values would be like uh, hate, greed, ang uh, unjustified rage. Uh, jealousy, those kinds of things. Um, and, uh, examples of, uh, right things would to be, would be like to do unto others as you would have done unto you. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Um, to, uh, uh, and examples of uh, things that you shouldn't do are like, uh, uh, don't get drunk, uh, don't murder, don't steal, those kinds of things. So those are examples of, uh, uh, that's like a short list of goods and bads and rights and wrongs. Okay. So, um, definitely encourage you guys to, uh, look into that more and uh, make your own, uh, list and talk about it uh, with each other. I'm just adjusting my face a little bit so I can make sure I'm staying in the, in the screen a little better, but, but yeah, so, uh, 
There's going to be some heavy uh, conversation tonight just because it, we are going to be dealing with uh, good and evil, right and wrong. And as soon as you're dealing with the evil and wrong, um, it's going to be some tough stuff. Um, Sam says, uh, is there an argument that could be made for intent, uh, such as someone who does the right thing but for selfish reasons and only for appearance uh, for their heart is not in it? Yes. Yep. Um, intent is incredibly important. Um, and that can uh, distinguish between a, a right action and a wrong action. Um, and, and you just uh, nailed it on the head, too. You know, like uh, you can do what would have been a right thing for evil reasons, you know, or you can do something that would be right or wrong for what uh, would have normally been wrong. But since uh, you can't, you know, like Sophie's choice, you know, it, it wasn't because Sophie had evil in her heart or bad intentions that she had her daughter shot and killed or sent her son to a concentration camp. So, yeah, so it it wasn't the, they they were evil choices, but that doesn't make Sophie evil. Um, she wasn't wrong to choose those to make those choice. She was right to make her choice because she couldn't have, because she couldn't do otherwise. Uh, it would have been more evil for her not to choose because uh, I think that they would have uh, killed both of them. Or, and at least in this situation, one of them had a chance to live, which was in this case, her son. She thought that he would have had a chance to live. Um, but yeah, yep. Intention is incredibly important. And this is a, uh, uh, this will become more uh, relevant when we uh, talk about the problem of evil later in the book, um, because a lot of people uh, um, question God's uh, whether or not he has good intentions for the things that he does. All right. So um, if there's uh, nothing else, then we will uh, go ahead and carry on. All right. So Dr. Craig continues. So there's a difference between good, bad and right, wrong. Good and bad has to do with something's worth, while right and wrong has to do with something's being obligatory. So objective and subjective. Second, uh, there's a distinction between being objective or subjective. And by objective, I mean independent of people's opinions. By subjective, I mean in dependent on someone's opinion. So to say that there are objective moral values is to say that something is good or bad, no matter what people think about it. Similarly, to say that we have a objective moral duties is to say that certain actions are right or wrong for us, regardless of what people think. So, for example, to say that the Holocaust was objectively wrong is to say that it was wrong even though the Nazis who carried it out thought it was right. And it would still have been wrong even if the Nazis had won World War II and succeeded in exterminating or brainwashing everybody who disagreed with them. So that... Everyone believed the Holocaust was right. Premise one asserts that if there is no God, then moral values and duties are not objective in that sense. So he uh, provides us with additional uh, explanation. Objective means independent of human opinion. For example, the laws of nature hold whether we acknowledge them or not. Uh, so they are objective. Subjective means uh, dependent on a human opinion. For example, uh, matters of taste, uh, like whether coffee tastes good, are person relative and so are uh, uh, subjective. So um, a good way to understand this distinction um, is uh, like, for example, here's my phone. And my phone is an object. Okay. It has uh, true features about it that are in mind independent. Um, but my opinions on whether or not this is a good phone or a bad phone, uh, those are subjective. Uh, whether or not it's a good color and things of that nature. Um, now, you, you, it can get complicated because uh, as whether or not it's a, an effective phone or things of that nature or a good phone uh, can also be objective if you clearly define what it means for a phone to be objective. Um, but still or clearly define what a, what it means for a phone to be better. Okay. So defense of 
Premise 1. Objective moral values require God. Uh, So consider first moral values. Traditionally, moral values have uh, been based in God, who is the highest good. But if God does not exist, what is the basis of moral values? In particular, why think that human beings have moral worth? The most popular form of atheism is naturalism, which holds that the only things that exist are the things described by our best scientific theories. But science is morally neutral. You can't find moral values in a test tube. It follows immediately that moral values don't really exist. They're just illusions of human beings. Even if the atheist is willing to go beyond the bounds of science, why think, given an atheistic worldview, that human beings are morally valuable? On a naturalistic view, moral values are just the byproduct of biological evolution and social conditioning. Just as a troop of baboons exhibit cooperative and even self-sacrificial behavior because natural selection has determined it to be advantageous, in the struggle for survival. So their primate cousin, Homo sapiens, exhibit similar behavior for the same reason. As a result of social social biological uh, pressures, uh, there has evolved among Homo sapiens a sort of herd morality, which functions well in the perpetuation of our species. But on the atheistic view, there doesn't seem to be anything about Homo sapiens that makes this morally objectively true. If we were to rewind the film of human evolution back to the beginning and start anew, people with a very different set of moral values might well have evolved. And now you have a uh, picture of uh, Charles Darwin to look at. There we go. Yep. Very nice. As Darwin himself wrote the in The Descent of Man, if men were reared under precisely the same conditions as hive bees, uh, there can hardly be a doubt that our unmarried females would, like the worker bees, Uh, think it a sacred duty to kill their brothers and mothers would strive to kill their fertile daughters and no one would think of interfering. For us to think that human beings are special or and are uh, morality objectively true is to succumb to the temptation uh, to speciesism and unjustified bias towards one's own species. So, uh, He says uh, here and defines it uh, more thoroughly as speciesism is a prejudice or attitude of bias in favor of the interests of members of one's own species and against those of members of other species. British psychologist and philosopher Richard Ryder coined the term in 1970 and it uh, was later picked up by many animal rights activists, including Peter Singer. So if there is no God, any basis for regarding the herd morality evolved by Homo sapiens is objectively true, as objectively true seems to be, seems to have been removed. Take God out of the picture and all you're left with is an ape-like creature on a speck of solar dust beset with delusions of moral grandeur. So, uh, objective moral duties require God. Second, now uh, consider moral duties. Traditionally, our moral duties were thought to spring from God's commands, such as the Ten Commandments. But if there is no God, what basis remains for objective moral duties? On the atheistic view, human beings are just animals, and animals have no moral obligations to one another. When a lion kills a zebra, it kills a zebra, but it does not murder the zebra. When a great white shark forcibly copulates with a female, it forcibly copulates with her, but it does not rape her. Uh, For there is no moral dimension to these actions. They are neither prohibited nor obligatory. So we're up to the next uh, question in the book. Talk about, uh, uh, try to come up with an atheist's argument to defend the idea that forcible copulation is morally wrong for for humans, but not for sharks. Uh, How would you reply? Uh, So, um, like I said earlier, uh, you can... uh, go with, uh, I think that there is a, you can go with natural law kind of, uh, ethics in which, uh, the, the world does, uh, correspond, uh, um, to particular forms and that world has moral features associated with it in which you can better exemplify or not exemplify. And so some atheists can go uh, the objective route with that and to say that it's wrong for humans to do it because it's not in accordance with the form of that world. Um, other atheists, uh, like Dr. Eric Wielenberg, uh, all of these are going to have uh, some sort of, uh, platonic realm to it. And Dr. Wielenberg has, uh, 
um, platonic, uh, it's like a, uh, um, a non-theistic, uh, uh, moral nominalism or normativism. And, uh, he says that, uh, moral obligations supervene on events in, in the world. And so you can obtain moral obligation through these, uh, abstract objects super or supervening on events. Um, but there's a lot of problems with, uh, both of these, uh, uh, avenues that people take. And one of them is that, uh, uh, when, when we say, how would I reply, you know, how would I reply to these is that, uh, these, uh, um, these, uh, moral models, uh, fail to, uh, encompass all of uh, morality, such as, uh, moral, uh, when it comes to moral obligation, even though you are instilled perhaps moral obligation supervenes on the event, but that doesn't really do anything, you know, like, because the big problem with these worldviews is that there's no moral accountability. Um, without some sort of omniscient being, then there isn't any moral accountability. And some non-Christians like to uh, go the route of like karma and karma is uh, like a non-personal moral judge of the universe. Um, but the problem with karma is that uh, I would agree that um, morality is limited to uh, conscious entities. And there really needs to be some sort of person to really make these judgments. Um, and, uh, and karma lacks personhood. So it can't judge uh, m morally speaking. So really, whenever I hear someone say, oh, karma got them, it's really like, a, oh, they, they have received God's judgment. You know, God judged them and has acted in accordance with his judgment now. Um, but yeah, moral accountability is a big problem for, for these non-theistic uh, moral models. Uh, Do says, uh, I find it difficult to, to delude myself enough to think like an atheist. So wow. <laughs> Uh, I hear you. Um, so uh, it, it's probably easier for me myself because uh, I try I uh, convinced myself that I was an atheist for years. Um, and so I'm more sympathetic towards uh, the view. But uh, I, I, I tell you, it, it can it's can be difficult to really uh, <laughs> uh, take it seriously sometimes, you know. But uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, so let's see here. Uh, so Dr. Craig continues. Um, do do you know, goes on and says I can't twist reality that much. Yeah, I hear you. You know, it, it, um, naturalism is such a stifling worldview. Um, there's really no reason to be a naturalist, uh, as I've discussed in previous videos and other videos uh, on YouTube. You know, there's a lot of. <laughs> reasons to not be a naturalist. So, um, so if God does not exist, why think that we have any moral obligation to do anything or the uh, who or what imposes these moral duties upon us? Uh, where do they come from? It's hard to see why they would be anything more than a subjective impression resulting from societal or parental conditioning. Certain actions such as incest and rape may not be biologically and socially ad advantageous, and so in the course of human development have become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to show that rape and incest is really wrong. Uh, such behavior goes, uh, goes on all the time in the animal kingdom. The rapist who goes against a herd morality is doing nothing more serious than acting unfashionably, like the man who belches loudly at the dinner table. If there is no moral law gave, giver, uh, then there is no objective moral law that we must obey. So getting clear about the argument. Now it's extremely important that we clearly understand the issue before us. I can almost guarantee that if you share this moral argument with unbelievers, uh, someone will say indignantly, are you saying that all atheists are bad people? They'll think you are judgmental and intolerant. Uh, we need to help them see that this is a complete misunderstanding of the argument. The question is not, must we believe in God in order to live moral lives? There's no reason to think that non-believers cannot live what we'd normally call good and decent lives. Again, the question is not, 
Can we recognize objective moral values and duties without believing in God? There's no reason to think that you have to believe in God in order to rec- recognize that, for example, we ought to love our children. Or again, the question is not, we, uh, can we formulate a system of ethics without referring to God? If the non-believer recognizes the intrinsic value of human beings, there's no reason to think he cannot work out an ethical code of conduct that, it, that the believer will generally agree with. Of course, he won't take into account to any moral obligations we have towards God. Rather, the question is, if God does not exist, do objective moral values and duties exist? The question is not about the, the necessity of belief in God for the objective morality, but about the necessity of the existence of God for objective morality. So it's about God's existence. The moral argument asserts not that belief in God is necessary for objective morality, but the existence of God is necessary. I've been shocked at how often even professional philosophers who should know better confuse these two questions. For example, I participated in a debate at Franklin and uh, Marshall College with the humanist philosopher Paul Kurtz on the topic, God, uh, goodness without God, without God is good enough. I argued that if God does not exist, there are no objective moral values, duties, or accountability for one's actions. Profe- Professor Kurtz, uh, to my astonishment, completely missed the point. He replied, if, it, if God is essential, then how is it possible that millions of people who do not believe in God nonetheless behave morally? On your view, they should not. And so your God is not essential. Many people have been optimistic about life. They have lived a full life and have found life exhilarating and richly significant. Nor do they wring their hands about whether or not there is an afterlife. It's living life here and now that counts. Kurtz's point uh, shows only that belief in God isn't essential for living a moral, optimistic life. It does nothing to refute my claim that there that if there is no God, then morality is just a human illusion. So we're up to the next question. How would you explain the fact that atheists just know that harming an innocent human being is wrong and can live good lives without believing that God is the ultimate source of values and duties? So... Um, while uh, the the extent of the moral landscape or the particulars of the moral landscape is extremely difficult to, to determine, we're still, even though we're in a fallen state, made in God's image, and uh, and as such, um, we have a even in even the most depraved uh, person is while on earth is still uh, has access to God and to the Holy Spirit merely by repenting. And that uh, quick access is enough for us to be able to ascertain these uh, more explicit moral features of the landscape. Okay, so it has a lot to do with being made in God's image and our and our ability to um, be in communion with God. All right, so... Let me know uh, what you guys think on the matter. Um, If not, uh, we can see what Dr. Craig says. Uh, He continues with, uh, to repeat, belief in God is not necessary for objective morality. God is. And so uh, I hope that you got it. He uh, said it quite a lot. (laughs) So it's not belief. It's the fact that of God's existence that's important for this argument. So the old... Euthyphro dilemma, and and by the way, uh, you guys are seeing uh, my highlights. Uh, this was uh, 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 the when I highlighted this book. Uh, I highlighted it like probably ten or eleven years ago, or something like that, when I first read it. So you're seeing my my uh, highlights as a, uh, a as a baby Christian. But uh, anyway, so the Euthyphro dilemma. Uh, the other response you can count on uh, getting from unbelievers is uh, the so-called Euthyphro dilemma, named after a character in one of Plato's dialogues. It basically goes like this. Is something good because God wills it, or does God will something because it is good? If you say that something is good because God wills it, then what is good becomes an arbitrary. God could have willed uh, that hatred is good, and then we would have uh, been morally obligated to hate one another. That seems crazy. Uh, Some moral values, at least, seem to be necessary. But if you say that God wills something because it is good, then what is good or bad is independent of God. In that case, moral values and duties exist independent of God, which contradicts premise one. 
So answer to the Euthyphro dilemma. We do not need to refute either of the two horns of the Euthyphro dilemma because the dilemma presents uh, the dilemma it presents is a false one. There's a third alternative, namely God wills something because he is good. What do I mean by that? I mean that God's own nature is the standard of goodness and his commands to us are expressions of his nature. In short, our moral duties are determined by the commands of a just and loving God. So he provides us with the youth of dilemma. Um, one, is something good because God wills it? Then good is arbitrary. Two, does God will something because it is good? Then it is a moral, then it is a moral value independent of God. The solution, God wills something because he is good. So moral values are not independent of God because his own character defines what is good. Uh, God is essentially compassionate, fair, kind, and partial, and so on. His nature is uh, the moral standard defining good and bad. His commands necessar- necessarily reflect his moral nature. Therefore, they're not arbitrary. When the atheist demands, if God were to com- command child abuse, would we be obligated to abuse our children? He's asking a question like, if there were, uh, if there were a square circle, would its area be the square of uh, one of its sides? There is no answer because it supposes a lot, it, uh, because what it supposes is logically impossible. So the youth of Rogue dilemma presents us with a false choice, and we shouldn't be tricked by it. The morally good slash bad is uh, determined by God's nature, and the morally right slash wrong is determined by His will. God wills something because He is good, and something is right because God wills it. So everything God wills is. Uh, grounded in God's character, okay? Atheistic moral Platonism, moral values simply exist. The mention of Plato brings to mind another possible response to premise one. Plato thought that God, uh, correction, uh, Plato thought that the good just exists on its own as part of a self-existent idea. If you find this difficult to grasp, join the club (laughs) or join the company. Uh, Later Christian thinkers equated Plato's good with God's moral nature, but Plato thought the good just existed by itself. Uh, So some atheists might say that the moral values like justice, mercy, love, and so on just exist without any foundation. We can call this view atheistic moral Platonism. It it holds that uh, objective moral, uh, moral values exist but are not grounded in God. What might we say about this view? So a straw man. The view of uh, moral values and duties explained in the text has been eloquently defended in our day by such eminent philosophers as Robert Adams, William Alston, and Philip Quinn. Yet atheists continue to put forward the same old euthyphro dilemma. In the, re- in the recent Cambridge Companion to Atheism, for example, the article on God and morality, written by a uh, prominent ethicist, refers neither to the work of these scholars nor to the solution explained here, but attacks only the view that God arbitrarily made up moral values, a straw man that virtually nobody defends. So, answer to atheistic moral Platonism. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, Dr. Craig actually contributed to the Cambridge Companion to Atheism. Um, He was a um, they needed somebody to defend the existence of God, so they had Dr. Craig write up an article. Um, I have that book. It, it's a, I refer to it often, actually. Um, anyway, uh, answer to atheistic moral Platonism. First, atheistic moral Platonism seems unintelligible. What does it mean to say, for example, that the moral value justice just exists? It's hard to make sense of this. It's easy to understand what it means to say that someone or that some person is just, but it's bewildering when someone says that in the absence of any people, justice itself exists. Moral values seem to be properties of persons, like I said earlier. Um, And it's hard to understand how justice can exist as an abstraction. Second, this uh, view... Uh, provides no basis for moral duties. Let's suppose for the sake of argument that moral values like justice, loyalty, mercy, forbearance, and the like just exist. What does that result in? Uh, how does that result in any moral obligation for me? Why would I have a moral duty to, to be, say, merciful? Who or what lays such an obligation on me? Uh, notice that on this view, moral vices like greed, hatred, lethargy, 
and uh, selfishness also presumably exists on their own as abstractions. So why are we obligated to align our lives with one set of these abstractly existing objects rather than any other? Atheistic moral Platonism lacks a moral lawgiver, has no grounds for moral obligation. Um, third, it's fantastically improbable that the blind evolutionary process which spit forth precisely the sort of creatures who correspond to the abstractly existing realm of moral values. This seems to be an utterly incredible coincidence when you think about it. It's almost as if the moral realm knew they were coming. It's far more plausible, as sorely contended, to think that both the natural realm and the moral realm are under the authority of a god who gave us uh, both the laws of nature and the moral law than to think that these two independent realms just happen to mesh. So stubborn humanism without the, uh, whatever contributes to human flourishing is good. So what's the atheist to do at this point? Most of them want to affirm the objective reality of moral values and duties, so they simply embrace some sort of humanism and stop there. Whatever contributes to human flourishing is good, and whatever detracts from it is bad. And that's the end of the story. So uh, humanism is a view that man is the measure of all things. In particular, man takes the place of God as the anchor of moral values and moral duties as determined by what promotes human flourishing. Just, just taking human flourishing as your ultimate stopping point seems, however, to be premature because of the arbitrariness and implausibility of such a stopping point. First, it's arbitrariness. Given atheism, why think that what is conducive to human flourishing is any more valuable than what is conducive to the flourishing of ants or mice? Why think that inflicting harm on another member of our species is wrong? When I put this question to the Dartmouth uh, ethicist Walter Sinot Armstrong in our debate on the existence of God, he replied, it simply is, objectively. Don't you agree? Of course I agree that it is wrong to harm another human being, but I pointed out that it, this is not the question. The question is, why would it be wrong if atheism were true? Uh, when I put this question to University of Massachusetts philosopher Louis uh, Anthony in our debate on Is God Necessary for Morality, she shot back, I wonder if you have any friends. I just smiled, but the point remains that, like it or not, given an atheistic worldview, picking out human flourishing as morally special seems to be arbitrary. Uh, second, it's implausibility. Atheists will sometimes say that moral properties like goodness and badness necessarily attach to certain natural states of affairs. For example, the property of badness necessarily attaches to a man's beating his wife. The property of goodness necessarily attaches to a... Uh, mother's nursing her infant. Atheists will say that once all the purely natural properties are in place, then the moral properties necessarily come along with them. Now, given atheism, this seems extraordinarily implausible. Why think that these strange, non-natural proper moral properties like goodness and badness even exist? Much like somehow, uh, much less somehow get to necessarily attach to various natural states of affairs. I can't see any reason to think that, given an atheistic view of the world, a full description of the natural properties involved in some situation would determine or fix any moral properties of that situation. These humanistic philosophers have simply taken a shopping list approach to ethical questions. Because they hold to humanism, they just help themselves to the moral properties they need to do the job. What's needed to make their view plausible is some sort of explanation for why moral properties attached to certain natural states of affairs. Again, it's inadequate for the humanists to assert that we do, in fact, see the human beings, uh, see that human beings have intrinsic moral value, for that's not in dispute. Indeed, that's the second premise of the moral argument. What we want to, from the humanist is some reason to think that human beings would be morally significant if atheism were true. If it is, then humanism is just a stubborn moral faith. By contrast, God is a natural stopping point as a foundation for objective moral values and duties. For unless we are moral nihilists, we have to recognize some stopping point. And God, as the ultimate reality, is the natural place to stop. Moreover, God is, by definition, worthy of worship, so, so that he must be the embodiment of perfect moral goodness. Again, God, by definition, is the greatest conceivable being. And a being that is the ground of and source of goodness is greater than one that merely shares in goodness. So theism isn't characterized by the sort of arbitrariness and implausibility that 
afflicts stubborn humanism. So now we're moving on to premise two. Objective moral values and duties exist. That brings us to our second premise, the objective moral values, that objective moral values and duties exist. I initially thought that this would be the most controversial premise in the argument, but my debates with atheistic philosophers, however, in my debates with uh, atheistic philosophers, however, I find that almost nobody denies it. Uh, it might surprise you to learn that uh, surveys taken at universities reveal, perhaps contrary to impression, that professors are more apt to believe in objective moral values than students, and that uh, philosophy professors are more apt to believe in objective moral values than professors in general. All right, so we get to talk about something. What do you make of the fact that professors are more apt to believe in objective moral values than students, and that philosophy professors are more apt to believe in objective moral values than professors in general? What might this say about these three groups of people? How might age be a factor? Education, popular culture. So um, uh, to me, this is a troubling trend. Um, so it, to me, it makes sense that uh, f- uh, philosophy professors believe in objective morality because they have a lot. They spend a lot of time thinking about uh, the how the world is, what truth is. And how humans relate to this world and humans relate to truth. And so it's not really surprising to me that they see the anguish and the joy of love and things of that nature and come to recognize that it can't be grounded in human nature because these features would persevere in the face of human extinction. Um, and so, uh, and the, as far as a general professor's going and, uh, believing that uh, objective morality exists more than the students. I'm not surprised there. Uh, Just because they're part of an older culture, which uh, seems to, you know, uh, kind of assume that uh, morality is objective. But um, the big problem is the students. And especially when you consider that this this book was written like 10 years ago. So a lot of these uh, students are now uh, as old as me, you know, like in their 30s. And uh, becoming extremely influential uh, through uh, creating ma- uh, material to um, to to what's what's the word I'm con- to consume you know like especially with how easy it is to create content nowadays like a uh, TikTok or YouTube videos like <laughs> like the stuff that I make and things of that nature um, and they and they believe that uh, morality is relative and they bring this relative. Uh, more moral beliefs into their content and and so perpetuates it at a greater rate than ever before you know before you had to be actually hired on to create shows for tv networks and now you can create children's content from your home whenever you want um and so you got to be really careful especially if you have little kids i i i have to babysit uh and I don't babysit Sala, you know, my daughter, my four-year-old. But I ha- what I mean by babysit is that I have to pay, pay close attention to the things that she consumes on YouTube kids. Um, because, you know, the YouTube overlords definitely don't have uh, Christian values in mind when uh, they survey this, this stuff. Um, and so what you got to... You got to, I've had to block a lot of uh, channels just because uh, they, um, they'll say things that from their perspective seem benign and in, in fairly innocent, but it's actually like, you know, like saying the Lord's name in vain or um, certain hard to detect innuendos that uh, children wouldn't really get. But uh, me as an adult, I, I pick it up right away. And, and so you got to be careful out there uh with the with the children but yeah that's a um yeah i think it, it has a lot to do with upbringing but uh but yeah let's see see what dr craig um is going to continue with with uh, the moral experience so philosophers who reflect on our moral experience see no more reason to distrust that experience than the experience of our five senses I believe that my five senses tell me, namely, that there is a world of physical objects out there. So he's, you know, we're talking about here sight, smell, taste, that kind of stuff. Like, 
this uh, goes beyond just like um, I, my senses inform me that I'm sitting at a desk and uh, I can hear my wife upstairs and things of that nature. Um, this even goes to the point of uh, your own body. You know, like, oh, man, I have hands and things like that. Um, that that's the significance of the external world, um, that, that you even have uh, eyeballs or a brain and things of that nature. The Your sense experience is different than uh, the features of your body. Um, so uh, ph philosophically speaking, it could be the case that you experience sight and you could not possibly have eyes. Um, in the case, like if you're a brain in a vat being uh, exposed to uh, chemical electrical reactions that uh, would produce uh, a sense of sight in you, you know, things of that nature. But uh, so Dr. Craig continues, I believe that my five senses tell me, namely, that there is a world of physical objects out there. Uh, my senses... My senses are not infallible, but that doesn't lead me to think that there is no external world around me. Similarly, in the absence of some reason to distrust my moral experience, I should accept what it tells me, namely that some things are objectively good or evil, right or wrong. Most of us would agree that in moral experience, we do apprehend objective values and duties. When I was speaking several years ago on a Canadian university campus, I noticed a poster put up by the Sexual Assault and Information Center. It read, Sexual Assault. No one has a right to abuse a child, woman, or man. Most of us recognize that sexual abuse of another person is wrong. Actions like rape, torture, and child abuse aren't just socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. By the same token, love, generosity, and self-sacrifice are really good. People who fail to see this are just are just handicapped, the moral equivalent of someone who is physically blind, and there's no reason to let their impairment call into question what we clearly see. I've found that although people give lip service to rel relativism, 95% can be very quickly convinced that objective moral values do exist after all. All you have to do is produce a few, a few illustrations and let them decide for themselves. Ask why they think that the Hindu practice of Suti, burning widows alive on the funeral pyres of their husbands, or the ancient Chinese custom of crippling women for life by tightly binding their feet from childhood to resemble uh, lotus blossoms. Uh, you can make the point especially effective by using moral atrocities perpetuated in the name of religion. Ask them what they think of the Crusades or the Inquisition. Ask them if they think it's all right for Catholic priests to sexually abuse little boys or for the church to try to cover it up. If you're dealing with someone who's an honest inquirer, I can guarantee that almost every time that person will agree that there are objective moral values and duties. Of course, sometimes you find hard liners. But usually their position is uh, seen to be so extreme that others are repulsed by it. For example, at a meeting of a Society of Biblical Literature a few years ago, I attended a panel discussion on biblical authority and homo homosexuality, in which all the panelists endorsed the legitimacy of homosexual activity. One panelist dis dismissed biblical prohibitions of such activity on the grounds that they reflect the cultural context in which they were written. Uh, since this is the case for all uh, for all of Scripture's commands, it wasn't written in a vacuum. He concluded that there are no timeless normative moral truths in Scripture. In discussion from the floor, I pointed out that such a view leads to social cultural relativism, which makes it impossible to criticize any social society's moral values, including those of the societies that per uh, persecutes homosexuals. He responded with a fog of theological double talk and claimed that there's no place outside Scripture where we can find, or find timeless moral values either. But that just is what we mean by moral relativism, I said. In fact, on your view, there's no content to the, no there's no content to the notion of the goodness of God. He might as well be dead. And Nietzsche recognized that the death of God leads to nihilism. On this point, another panelist came in with a knockdown refutation. Well, if you're going to get to pejorative, we might as well not discuss it. Um, so now we're up to the next uh, uh, 
talk about. Uh, what is it about humans that allows or even encourages them to live with logical inconsistency? Why, when faced with a logical argument like the one in this chapter, do they so easily say whatever and go about their business unchanged? <laughs> uh, because it is uh, convenient, you know? Um, I ha recently had a conversation with somebody uh, talking about the problem of induction and how big of a problem it is for uh, naturalism. And uh, they... Uh, they uh, uh, had a tough time understanding what the problem was, but uh, once I think that they did start to understand what the problem was, and then uh, they uh, said that uh, even if it is uh, circular, I just don't, it doesn't bother me. They, a lot of people would rather cling to their priors, their prior intuitions, what they have come to accept, than um, do the hard work of uh, trying to form a model that uh, is satisfactory for the situation at hand. Um, it is a, a lot easier to kind of just ignore problems and just stick with what you believe already, you know? So it's uh, it's just easier to do that. Um, I, I guess I'm just blessed with the, uh, with the fact that I enjoy trying to form models to better understand the data. Uh, so I, I am just blessed with this interest. Um, so I don't, I try not to judge people on it because it could be very, I could very easily fall into this trap as well and prefer to just go on with my life and play video games or you know, just watch TV or YouTube endlessly. But, um, uh, but yeah, uh, God has given me this interest to, to pursue this stuff. And, uh, and an attempt to try to help people also pursue this stuff uh, locally and online. But Dr. Craig continues, I sat down, but the point wasn't lost on the audience. The next man who stood up said, wait a minute. I'm rather confused. I'm a pastor and people are always coming to me asking me if something they've done is wrong and if they need forgiveness. For example, isn't it always wrong to abuse a child? I couldn't believe the panelist's response. She replied, "What counts as abuse differs from society to society, so we really so we can't really use the word abuse without tying it to a historical context." "Call it whatever you like," the pastor insisted, "but child abuse is damaging to children. Isn't it wrong to damage children?" And still she wouldn't admit it. This sort of hardness of heart ultimately backfires on the moral relativists and exposes in the minds of most people the bankruptcy of such a worldview. So social biological objections to moral experience. The question then is, do we have any overriding reason to distrust our moral experience? Some people have claimed that the social biological accounts of the origins of morality undermines our moral experience. Accounting, uh, according to that account, you'll remember our moral beliefs have been ingrained into us by evolution and social conditioning. Does that give us reason to distrust our moral experience? So answers to uh, social, the social biological objections. The social uh, biological account clearly does nothing to undermine the truth of our moral beliefs. For the truth of a belief is independent of how you came to hold that belief. You may have uh, acquired your moral beliefs through a fortune cookie or by reading tea leaves, and they could still happen to be true. In particular, if, God's exist, if God exists, then objective moral values and duties exist, regardless of how we come to learn about them. The social biological account at best proves that our perception of moral values and duties has evolved. But if the moral values are gradually discovered, not invented, then our gradual and fallible perception of those values no more undermines their objective reality than our gradual, fallible perception of the physical world undermines its objective reality. So then he talks about what the genetic fallacy is. Uh, this informal fallacy attempts to invalidate a view by showing how a person came to believe that view. For example, the only reason you believe in democracy is because you were raised in a democratic country. Therefore, your view that democracy is the best form of government is false. As an, objective, as an objection to the truth of moral judgments, the social biological account is guilty of the genetic fallacy. But perhaps the social biological account undermines not the truth of our moral beliefs, but our justification for holding such beliefs. 
If your moral beliefs are based on reading tea leaves, they might accidentally turn out to be true, but you wouldn't have any justification for believing they are true. So you wouldn't know that they are true. Similarly, the objection is that if our moral beliefs have been shaped by evolution, then we can't have any confidence in them because evolution aims not at truth but at survival. Our moral beliefs will be selected for their survival value, not for their truth. So we can't trust our moral experience and therefore don't know if uh, premise 2 is true. There are two problems with this objection to our knowledge of premise 2. First, it assumes that the atheism is true. If there is no God, then our moral beliefs are selected by evolution solely for their survival value, not for their truth. I, I myself press this point in defending premise 1. If God does not exist, then the social biological account is true and our moral beliefs are illusory. But, you see, there's no reason to um, think that the social biological account is true. Indeed, if God exists, then it's likely he would want us to have fundamentally correct moral beliefs and so would either guide the evolutionary process to produce such beliefs or either instill them in us. Apart from the assumption of uh, atheism, we have no reason to deny that our moral experience, what our moral experience tells us. So Romans 2, uh, 14 through 15, even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts where their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they're doing right. Second, the objection is self-defeating. Given the truth of naturalism, all our beliefs, not just our moral beliefs, are the result of evolution and social conditioning. Thus, the evolutionary account leads to skepticism about knowledge in general. But this is self-defeating because then we should be skeptical of the evolutionary account itself since it, too, is uh, the product of evolution and social conditioning. The objection, therefore, undermines itself. So given the warrant provided by premise 2, by our moral experience, we are justified in thinking that objective moral values and duties exist. Conclusion! For the two premises, uh, from the two premises, it follows that God exists. The moral argument complements the cosmological and design arguments by telling us about the moral nature of the creator of the universe. It gives us a personal, necessarily existent being who is not only perfectly good, but whose nature is the standard of goodness and whose commands constitute our moral duties. In my experience, the moral argument is the most effective of all the arguments for the existence of God. I say this grudgingly because uh, my favorite is the cosmological argument. But cosmological and teleological arguments don't touch people where they live. The moral argument cannot be so easily brushed aside. For every day you get up, you answer the question of whether there are objective moral values and duties by how you live. It's unavoidable. So in answer to the question that opened this chapter, no, we cannot truly be good without God. But if we can in some measure be good, then it follows that God exists. All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being with me through that. We uh, got to the end together, so we get to celebrate. Yay! Woohoo! We got to the end. We did it together. I know how everybody loves is a celebration. But, but yeah, uh, next up is uh, the... Um, the argument map, you know, uh, so we'll uh, go over this argument, uh, argument map together. Um, um, uh, so that we can, uh, uh, just do a quick recap of what we just read. I know it's a lot, but, uh, I think this is really good for us. So number one, uh, this is the first premise of the argument. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. And uh, then a lot of people will, will reply, uh, how dare you say all atheists are bad people? To which we can reply, the issue is not belief in God, but the existence of God. So we are not saying that atheists are bad people. Okay, this argument is not saying that atheists are bad people. Number two, they provide us with the youth of road dilemma. So uh, God's nature is good and his will necessarily expresses his nature. So remember, the youth of Freud's dilemma gives us uh, two horns, but it's a false dichotomy. It's a false dilemma. Um, there's a middle ground in which God is good. Okay. Um, so uh, 
Another reply is atheistic moral Platonism. So, and we can reply it's unintelligible, uh, has no basis for duty, and is improbable. You can also say that it lacks accountability. You know, there's no moral accountability, ultimate moral accountability. There may be some finite accountability with regard to other humans uh, holding us accountable to m- more um, these objective features of morality, but ultimately you can get away with stuff. So uh, another con is uh, humanism. And uh, humanism is an arbitrary and implausible stopping point. So why prefer to stop your moral features at humans? It seems to be that God, as the ultimate ground of reality, would is the most appropriate stopping point. (laughs) All right, so the next uh, part of the argument map is... uh, Let's see here. Uh, Boop. So uh, objective moral values and duties do exist. That's the second premise. So uh, this is uh, we obtain this belief or we obtain justification for believing that this premise is true through our moral experience. Um, And we've uh, we've addressed a lot of that through this talk. But uh, when when you see moral atrocities and experience moral outrage or anger there's a reason for that and it's not just because it's uh, your flavor you know it's because uh, we do recognize uh objective moral values moral duties of that nature but somebody could say that it's a social biological account the social biological account invalidates moral experience but it doesn't undermine the truth of moral beliefs okay so this is just saying that we obtain our moral values through through our cultural conditioning as well as our biological evolution but dr craig was saying this is the genetic fallacy um that it doesn't really matter how you come to or that how you come to believe things is uh can be justified or unjustified but it doesn't impact the truth of those beliefs those beliefs can be true even if the way you go about obtaining that belief is weird (laughs) So, uh, but social biological account doesn't undermine the justification of moral beliefs. So it assumes that atheism is true and it's ultimately self-defeating. And therefore you get to the last of it, which is uh, therefore God exists. All right. So we got through the argument map. And um, so we got to the end of uh, today's stream, uh, reading the book. Um, uh, I really appreciate you guys coming out and, uh, and doing this together with me. Thanks for interacting with me in the chat. Um, it's a uh, it's great having you guys out here and uh, um, giving me the opportunity to uh, do this and upload it to YouTube. Yeah, we did it. So, dude just said we did it. So, uh, um, but yeah, uh, stay tuned to to YouTube. I'm gonna be uploading this to YouTube, and then I've uh, figured out a way to make it a uh, better quality the last videos have been so <laughs> i've had to download them directly from facebook and uh, uh the visible the video quality is is not very good uh but the, this one should be good and i'm gonna be able to do some neat stuff with it so i'm excited about it but anyway uh god bless everyone and have a great night and i'll see you again next week all right bye-bye Hey, before you go, I hope you enjoyed today's enlightening discussion during our Christian Apologetics book study. It's always a blessing to come together to explore our faith and grow in our understanding. Your participation means the world to me, and I'm grateful for your continued support of Northeast Christian Apologetics. Remember, you can stay connected with me and access valuable resources by visiting my website at nechristianapologetics.com. There you'll find a wealth of articles, videos, and recommended reading material to deepen your knowledge of Christian apologetics. If you're as passionate as I am about equipping believers to defend their faith and engage in meaningful conversations, you can also support this ministry in various ways. One way to support this work is through patreon.com. 
By becoming a patron, you'll have access to exclusive content, early access to our discussions, and a chance to connect with like-minded individuals who share your passion for Christian apologetics. If Patreon is not your style, some people prefer to give me a one-time tip. And if you'd like to do that, then uh, feel free to do so through Venmo or Cash App. But of course, there are many ways to support me. By praying for this ministry, sharing the content on social media, or simply spreading the word about what I do. Every bit of support goes a long way in helping me fulfill my mission. Once again, thank you for joining me today. Your presence and engagement enrich these discussions, and together, we're on a journey to strengthen our faith and share the good news with others. Stay tuned for more exciting book studies, thought-provoking discussions, and opportunities to grow your Christian apologetics journey. I look forward to seeing you again.